Okay, so uh, Amrita Kara has research interest in DNA pattern genome projects. Okay, and Gayatri has interest to see its applicability in omics. Okay, uh, can you also let me, okay, we have one more response to decipher the genetic code to early detection of diseases. That's pretty interesting. And Surya Pratap says, I want to know and learn how data science is working with uh, biomedical data and how it is so helpful. Yes, it's a pretty interesting field and I'm sure that you'll be enjoying a lot from this program. Uh, what about the rest of you guys? I can see a few of them are still, uh, have not shared. Can you guys also let me know what your research interests are? Okay, so uh, Ade Busola has shared that he is a researcher and proficient in the use of SPSS and has just completed omic pin production and is working on uterine fibroid at molecular level. And he's interested in developing knowledge as to how to apply it to uh, his knowledge based on the omics logic training. That's pretty interesting. I can see that a lot of the participants have a diverse range of interest and are coming from a diverse range of backgrounds. What about the rest of you guys? Let me know in the chat, what are your research interests? Uh, also, I'm curious to know, has everyone enrolled for the program or are waiting to enroll as of yet? Okay, so Divya has enrolled for the program. That's great. And um, Mahnas is a postdoc in synthetic biology and has a background in data science. 
and is here to see if the program is the best fit for me. All right. Uh, I'm sure that you'll be able to enjoy a lot from the mentor. He'll be giving you a brief overview during the first session about the program as well. And it's going to be an interactive one as well. So I'm sure that you guys will be able to make the most out of it. And what about the rest of you guys? Have you guys enrolled? Or are you waiting to get enrolled? All right, so meanwhile, the participants are sharing. Let me start with the today's session. So hello everyone, a very warm greeting to one and all. My name is Srigauri Krishnagumar and I would like to welcome you all for the very first session on biomedical data science in Python. So for those of you who have just joined the program, this program will cover practical and conceptual aspects of machine learning in application to high throughput biomedical data using various tools and Python. Throughout the program, students will get an understanding of the opportunities and limitations of machine learning in the context of preclinical and clinical research. So in today's session, we will cover topics on introduction to big data in bioinformatics, introduction to bioinformatic languages, specifically Python, and using the code playground as well as loading data in Python. So before we begin with today's session, let me also take a brief moment to introduce you to the team behind the program. We are a US-based bioinformatics company who is working with multiple academic and commercial collaborators to develop easy to use analytical tools. And our mission is to make bioinformatics more accessible. And as a part of the program, students will have access to the omics logic training that has been completed by over 24,000 participants from 187 countries in over 300 workshops. And due to this fast growth, our team is working with local and regional coordinators that are helping refine local program logistics and adapting them to the needs of students and researchers around the world. And this training has been completed by participants in six different specialization tracks that includes oncology, infectious diseases, precision medicine, neuroscience, data science for biomedical data, and comprehensive training on omics data analysis. And students will also have access to the omics logic resources. But how does it help advance bioinformatics teaching? Omics logic is a portal for practical and theoretical learning of bioinformatics. It takes a combination of training modules, data analysis tools, curated project data sets, and interactive sessions with mentors to give the student a clear path of the Bloom's taxonomy pyramid. And no matter what the user's initial experience with bioinformatics is, Omics Logic is a useful tool for gaining a baseline knowledge of the theory behind bioinformatics, analysis of large data sets, and introduction to basic coding languages like R and Python, or even beginning a data analysis project. And this also comes with an access to the omics logic courses, which include courses on bioinformatics, precision medicine, multi-omics, that makes use of genomics, transcriptomics, epigenomics, metagenomics, data science, that makes use of bioinformatics using R and Python, as well as cheminformatics. And example projects of different fields, which you could learn from and replicate for your research work. So as a part of the program, users will also be given directions to access the T-BioInfo platform for bioinformatic processing and analysis of data. And the platform includes demo pipelines, as well as data management and analysis cloud infrastructure to run the bioinformatic pipelines. And different stages of analysis are performed in different sections on this multi-omics platform. So to view the various courses, example projects, and student projects, you need to first sign up on the Omics Logic Learn portal before that, let me walk you through a brief demo on what a completed profile on the portal looks like. So once you sign up on the Omics Logic, Omics Logic Learn portal, these are the features that you need to update on your account. That is, a completed profile will have a profile image, full name with appropriate capitalization, link to your social media handles, and a brief bio about yourself that will consist of your educational background and research interest. And under the mentors, and under the activity tab, the mentors will be viewing your progress. Under the courses tab, 
It will show you the various courses that you're currently completing. Finally, after the completion of your course, the certificates will appear under the certificates tab. So that was all about signing up on the Omens Logic Learn portal. So now let me take you to the portal and show you how you can sign up so that you can also take a look at the various resources that you will be made use of as a part of the program. So in the chat box, I've still the link to the Omics Logic Learn portal. When you click on the link, you will see uh, such an interface. So I can see that few of the participants have already enrolled for the program. So, and um, I'm assuming that most of you have created a profile on the portal. If not, let me show you how you can. So you'll see create an account option. Uh, so just click on that. And then you can enter your name, email ID, and password. This is one way you can create an account, or you can also create an account using any of your social media handles. This could be your Google, Facebook, Apple, Apple account, GitHub account, or even Twitter. This is another way you can log. So I'll pause for a couple of seconds so that the participants can sign up. And if you have signed up, you can simply click on the login now option and simply click on sign in. So once you have signed up on portal, please put a yes in the chat box so that I know I can proceed further. Okay, Mahanas has signed up. Shay has signed up. What about the rest of you guys? I'll quickly sign up so that I can show you the various courses. Okay, Mahek has signed up. Divya has signed up. Eugene has signed up. Okay, so I can see that few participants have signed up. What about the rest of you guys? I'm expecting responses from rest of the participants. If you are having any technical queries, you can share that in the chat as well, and we'll be happy to guide you. Okay, so few of them have signed up. So let me quickly um, sign in and show you, but uh, keep letting me know about your responses in the chat box as I'll be monitoring them as well. So once you sign up on the portal, the very first interface that you will be seeing is the courses page. So here, when you scroll down, you'll see a search bar that asks for looking for a specific course. So since most of the participants are interested in Python, we can simply enter the keyword Python, and that will show you the various courses and example projects that are making use of the Python uh, concept. You can browse through and um, navigate to your own pace. Let's say you're interested in machine learning. It will also show you the various courses and example projects. So uh, feel free to browse through and uh, navigate at your pace. So for now, uh, going to the part where I was explaining about updating your profile. For that, you can simply click on the tab that says welcome back with your email ID. So when you click on that tab, it will directly take you to the accounts uh, profile setting page. So here you will see an icon that says profile. So once you click on this, you will be asked to um, enter your details such as your bio, your name, link uh, in your, your social media, accounts. So in this case, I've linked my LinkedIn account and my org ID, and I've also uploaded my profile picture. So this is what a completed profile looks like, uh, as I've shown in my presentation. And as explained previously, under the activity tab, the community manager and the program mentor will be tracking your learning progress. It will be displayed as such. And the courses that you are currently completing will be displayed under the courses tab. So recently I've started taking up uh, transcriptomic analysis in Python course. So that is the recent course that I'm going through. And once you complete any of your uh, project um, it, and publish it on our portal, it will be displayed under the project tab. And once you enroll for the program, the program uh, will be displayed under the program tab. Finally, after the completion of your coursework, quizzes and required assignments, you'll be able to receive the certificates for the courses that you have been completing. So that was all about um, navigating through the portal. And you can also take a look at the various student projects under the projects tab. As you can see, a diverse range of students have worked on topics ranging from oncology, infectious diseases, precision medicine, neuroscience, and so on. You can take a look at um, those as well. Many, a uh, few of them have used Python solely for uh, data analysis. So it will be giving you ideas as well. So that was all about navigating through the portal.
so I can see a few queries. Um, Gayatri will be signing up after the meeting. Uh, all right. And Dr. Garima is asking about the fee structure. Yes, that will be explained during the end of, towards the end of the today's session, where we'll be explaining about the program details, fee structure, and the scholarships available uh, for the participants. So if the participants have no other queries, let's move on to the uh, session by the program mentor. For that, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Agvindran Lakshmi Narayan to start with the today's uh, session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sri Gauri. Thank you very, very much for, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for explaining how to sign up on how to get get everybody started with this program let me find ways to share my screen and confirm that you can see my screen should be up soon can you see my screen now it's not gone yet. i think yeah not yet right yeah wait a second okay I have to start sharing or start the slideshow and then hit share button or else it won't work. Hmm. Let's try one more time. Yes, sir. now we can see your screen. Okay, great, but terrific. So I can follow your chat <clears throat> and yeah. So if you have any queries, we will uh, discuss this whenever you have this query, just put it up in the chat. So when I feel that is relevant, we will uh, I will address them and <clears throat> other queries we will address in the towards the end of the meeting. <laughs> okay, um, so I again welcome everybody. Will I resize my yeah? So again, um, welcome everybody to the first session of today's program, getting started with biomedical data science in Python. Sorry about that. So we will learn, for example, today about what constitutes big data, which is going to be a major part of understanding biomedical data science, right? And also in the field of bioinformatics and why a programming environment like Python or even R is best suited for these big data analysis. And finally, we will also see if we can get an introduction to um, <clears throat> how omics data, data can be loaded into Python's environment for data exploration. And while going through this, we will also discuss about how uh, different inbuilt data types and structures, uh, literally, right, not uh, conceptually, in Python will help us understand the omics data types and what are the different ways we can analyze them, right? So to proceed, <clears throat> let's begin with what is bioinformatics, and we can define bioinformatics as a convergence of biology and data science where both are actually important as we will see in next few slides, right? And in order to emphasize on the fact who uses bioinformatics and who is interested in using bioinformatics as a analytics method, right? Earlier, this answer could have been anybody from statistics or anybody that, that is an engineer or from computer science background. But nowadays, it's more and more biologists and clinicians are actually trying to use bioinformatics to aid their own data, to help their own data to get published, to, to get succeed, um, to get successfully, um, uh, get publications in, uh, in uh, basic and translational research and et cetera. So these, uh, uh, these events show us uh, or reveal us that biology itself is actually rapidly acquiring the character of data science. It's not like the observational science that it was done something like 20 years ago anymore. It's more and more of uh, biological questions always start with what are the big data that we can find that we can make use of, right? That will give us a head start. So this is the, the context in which we will be using biological data to understand biology from that can fuel new research, that can fuel new applications, that can also help you um, unearth new questions. And if your analysis methods and analysis source or data are large enough, that can be an independent publication themselves. Okay, so we have seen that, uh, we have discussed that in the previous slide that um, biology in today's era is 
is almost a data science. It's, it's rapidly acquiring many of the salient features and characteristics of the data science, like uh, biological data has billions and billions of data points uh, on genes, proteins, and other macromolecules and biological data are usually compiled in large files and they are systematically studied, right? So whenever we have such a rich data available, analyzing this data will lead to more knowledge and will lead to understanding generally about the biology of the living organisms that can include human health, that will also include crops, livestock, and general biotechnology also, right? Okay. Such amount of huge volume of data and their influx actually fuels a lot of methodologies that can be developed to understand biology from this data-driven approach not from a hypothesis-driven approach. So what do I mean by that? So as I mentioned earlier, biology used to be uh, used to begin with hypothesis-driven hypothesis approach, right, or observation-driven approach. You start with an idea, you start with a question, and then you devise a methodology to measure the necessary parameters to understand or to uh, validate that hypothesis, to understand or evaluate those questions. But not anymore. Now, we, the moment that we start to think about a problem in biology, we gather all the data that is available. We purely go from data centric. Uh, we can also purely go from a data centric point of view where we understand the patterns in the data and those exploratory analysis that can lead to much very well-defined and much more, uh, I mean, uh, very well-defined questions with uh, much higher resolution than what we have started with, with uh, with the knowledge base or with the known publication that is going to focus on few or only part of this data that is available in the public repository. So uh, that is why we are uh, more and more uh, uh, resorting to data science and data analytics um, methods, data science and data analytics method to understand biology itself. Okay, let's so what is this big data and where do this big data come from, right? This field actually is based on high throughput technologies like next generation sequencing technology that can generate billions and billions of data points on DNA, on proteins and other molecules, right? And these data points and these molecules can characterize biological systems, biological phenomena, and hence can be helped to systematically study understand, interrogate, and establish trends for many different applications of uh, in disease-oriented studies like infectious biology, in, in general condition understanding-oriented studies like, uh, like neurodegenerative diseases, or to study biology of plants and other microbes like metagenomics that are focus of how they are involving and how they are incorporated into our body uh, and, and their symbiotic nature can affect or help our body or their dysbiotic uh, results can, um, can be a problem for our uh, health also. So these are all the different ways in which big data is shaping up questions and research approaches in biology in themselves. So is this data available? So the moment that we spoke about large volumes of data and humongous data cal characterizing many different types and etc. So where is this data available and is this data available? And uh, in short, yes, it is available. And we have been using a sister uh, concern or sister repository uh, of such data, uh, like um, that is based in National Center for Biological Inter Biotechnology Information, NCBI. And NCBI maintains many such big data. And one of the data that is derived data that we always uh, <laughs> have referred to is the PubMed uh, uh, database, which is a huge database of many of the publications um, focusing on biomedical research, right? So uh, if we take not, I mean, if we take just only one part of this uh, NCBI repository, that is gene expression omnibus, which, um, which predominantly collects uh, gene expression data or transcriptomics data, and and uh, um, and and that transcriptomics data that is that is 
publicly uh, uh, available and that we can use it for further analysis also, right? We can easily count over 80,000 publicly available such data sets in GEO alone. But there are other sources of data from NCBI um, under the umbrella of NCBI itself that we can refer to, like the SRA data, which is uh, which is going to our uh, which is uh, specifically uh, uh, created and and holds a, a record of all the uh, high throughput sequencing uh, 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 unstructured data. Right, and we can also refer to NCBA virus in the uh, in the context of current pandemic, which contains a separate uh, uh, dashboard or separate uh, subsection for COVID and coronavirus related uh, uh, sequence information and derived uh, uh, data. So these are all the different data that we can refer to throughout the course of this program, and we will keep referring to that uh, while trying to understand in what ways Python can help us uh, unearth or relate the uh, uh, trends in this data to understand the biology, basic biology behind it. So but the moment that we say or that we speak about data, right? And, and uh, um, now you get a chance to focus on the data itself without the need to uh, even think about the associated biology. So we can speak about data and for example, hmm, uh, this data can actually fuel developing different methods of storing and analyzing data and subsequently different methods of recording data also, right? So that we can effectively extract very useful information from this. So uh, how do I mean by that? For example, nowadays, the high throughput sequencing machines can actually work without any human intervention at all. All you need is to prepare the library and then let the, the machine do its job so that in the end you will get digital biological data. And how are these digital biological data stored and in what format they are stored and they are available? In short, they're all available as unstructured data. So what do I mean by unstructured data? There are some examples of unstructured data like audio data, image data, like, uh, I mean, mass media posts data, reviews on in reviews data, these are all unstructured. And um, I will demonstrate you in, in a short while about the difference between unstructured and structured data. And we can actually convert this unstructured data through a series of analysis, bioinformatics analysis, right? Not this unstructured data, but the biological unstructured data that the sequencer machine is going to give it to us, right? We can, uh, uh, use a genomics pipeline or transcriptomics pipeline to convert this unstructured data into structured data, basically a tabular form of data that can be used for further downstream analysis using any method, not only using Python, but you can even use Excel for a small analysis or for short analysis um, on this uh, structured data. So we, we also have some, some of the data that is in between like uh, semi-structured data and they are loosely organized into uh, um, uh, files, folders, and, uh, and um, <clears throat> um, for example, categories that uh, we will also get, uh, get ourselves familiarized with semi-structured data, which is going to be the structure of downloading data from um, uh, gene expression omnibus and et cetera. So to give you a practical example of these three different forms of data. If I'm going to ask you a very generic question, what is your educational background, right? Then you can respond in very different ways, right? For example, you can say that uh, as simple as one line answer, like I'm a graduate student or simply graduate student, or you can give a whole passage of uh, your educational background. And if I go through these answers as a human being, I will be able to understand and uh, contextualize most of this information. I will not have any difficulty. But when I ask an algorithm to do this, that will be a disaster. There is no uniformity in this data. All this data vary in line, uh, in, in total length, right? Uh, in the size, in the length, in the volume, in whatever way that you can categorize, you can do that. For example, I have a degree in biotechnology and I have I am a bachelor in bachelorate uh, or uh, my undergraduation is focused in biotechnology can mean the same thing. 
but uh, for a computer for an algorithm they can mean two different things they, and it will not uh, um, include these two in the same umbrella so so what to do in this case right the, we have to use algorithms to understand the data and the trends inside the data but in the same way we will we we uh, <laughs> cannot afford to um, spend so much time and effort in uh, taking humans or human health to convert these uh, unstructured data into a structured data or semi-structured data. So to get around this problem, we introduce structure at the point of data generation themselves, right? Something like this. So instead of asking a generic or a, or a descriptive question, what is your educational background? I can give you options. So I can give you four different options. So the moment that we do this, we enable an algorithmic uh, um, processing of the in of the data that I can collect, right? But now you can see a problem by comparing what we learned in the previous slide and what is here. I could not or uh, I cannot cover all possible options that I can get my hands onto. I can keep increasing the number of options that I give, but some day or some time, some of the options that I might keep losing them, right? So when we tend to introduce a structure in the data generation process, we tend to lose some information. So we should be prepared for this. Structuring an unstructured data will eventually result in some percentage of loss of some data. So we should think about it. Also, we should keep this in mind generally. So by forcing structure, can actually result in a reduced amount of information that we can collect, right? And to counter that, we just keep generating more or collecting more and more data, right? Or what we can do is, as I mentioned, we can collect unstructured data or data in unstructured format. I can collect everything like what I see here. Uh, this is done as an example uh, in one of the sessions like this. And we even see some emoticons there. So that is uh, how to process these data. Then by using a combination of human inter, uh, uh, interaction or uh, intervention and uh, algorithmic uh, study, we can force or we can evaluate or we can actually uh, capture the structure from the data and then analyze it and reveal what's inside the data, etc. So of course, when we do this, we definitely are going to lose some information. So we don't worry about that because we can get around that situation by simply collecting more and more data or by simply collecting replicates of such data right so let's let's go uh, let's see what are these uh, what are the characteristics of what we actually discussed are shared uh, by biological data or big data biological data right big by bi how to say that biological big data right we definitely see that uh, three different Vs, right? Now there are five Vs. We talk about velocity, variability, volume, veracity, and one more V, right? And um, these three are very important among those. We see, uh, of course, yes, we see humongous volume of data that is available. And of course, we see that there is huge variability in the data that we collect, right? Even between, uh, even within uh, uh, data collection from one source of uh, uh, input, like, um, a data collection from one country or data collection from uh, even within a country or state that can uh, that can result or that can contain humongous variability in the data right and and the data actually grows at a at, a, at an exponential rate right the velocity of uh, data generation is is really um, remarkable in biological uh, <coughs> data generation by uh, big data or mixed data generation so to make sense of all this data, what should we do? Most of this data is unstructured, right? That's what we discussed. And to make sense of unstructured data, we have to convert this unstructured data into structured data, or we have to process it and prepare for further downstream analysis. And those processing methods can differ by the type of data that we are going to use. Like, for example, we can use genomics data and process it to understand gene variants or uh, not gene variants, uh, genomic variants or difference difference in the position, uh, difference in the genomic positions compared to the uh, 
a reference genome that is being uh, that uh, that is uh, uniform for all over uh, all the biological research concerning genomics data. Exactly, SNP variants, right? You will learn about what what these are in um, in introduction to bio bioinformatics uh, uh, associated resource. If you go to the associated resource, uh, you can also spend some more time in in the other areas where that is going to teach you <clears throat> about the biology behind what is SNP and what is uh, SNV and why do we call uh, one and why do we call uh, not all SNVs are SNPs and all these information is available there. So let's go forward. Yes. And we can use, for example, methylation data to understand gene regulation themselves, right? And uh, we that gene regulation can directly affect the transcriptomics landscape of a cell. We can understand transcriptomic landscape of a cell or a sample by uh, analyzing the RNA seq data, right? So these all, all these different data and their associated sequences or sequence of analysis, which is usually called as pipelines, referred to as pipelines, are specific to that specific type of omics data. We can extend this to proteomics, metabolomics, metagenomics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Eventually. The one common thing in all of these different kinds of structuring of omics data is take this omics data from multiple molecules or record this omics data from, uh, from, from, from a variety of molecules and then subject them to proper processing algorithms and proper processing pipelines, convert these unstructured data into a structured data or a table, which we can use for further downstream analysis. Okay. So we can either record our own data and do whatever that we have discussed in the previous study, or we can use the power or we can use the humongous volume of unstructured data that is stored in the public repositories to come up with our own method of structuring data that is that we believe is going to be uh, extremely suited to answer or to focus on the hypothesis or a question that we are generating. Okay, so if we look at the discrepancy between the amount of unstructured data and structured data available, there is still scope for all of us to um, excellently structure our career around this unstructured data itself. So uh, feel free to uh, explore more of this unstructured data and, and um, come up with different techniques with which we can understand the basic biology behind this data. So what can we do? For example, this is an example uh, 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 of how a sequence pipeline can actually work in our favor, right? So uh, we take the raw data, raw unstructured data, which is usually stored in FASTQ file format. And this FASTQ file format that stores the raw data will contain short reads or short stretches of sequences that are sequenced by the sequencer machine, yeah, can, uh, right? And these short reads can actually be aligned to their respective positions in the, uh, in the frame of uh, reference genome, right? And these reads and the reference genome can come from a different variety of different organisms. If we want to focus on SARS, then we can use the sars cov to sample and sars cov to reference genome. If you want to study human related condition, then we can take the sample from the uh, from the <clears throat> uh, from the disease or altered sample and then perform this analysis uh, <clears throat> to understand what are the positions that are different in the uh, diseased state of the sample compared to the reference genome. So how typically how will we do this? We take the raw FASCI files and then we subject that to a, a pipeline or genomics pipeline or simply DNA variant calling pipeline. And in the end, we get a variant calling file or VCF file or a table of mutation. This is how we actually structure our um, pipeline, analysis pipeline in the uh, big data bioinformatics server that you will have access to once you get registered into this program. Okay, but how to do that and everything, all this information is available in the learn portal. But that is not going to be the focus of our uh, program in this program. So what will be the focus of our program? So this is, this is I want to sidestep. Uh, this will explain what a variant is. When you align the short stretches of sequence against the reference genome, you can identify the differences like this, right? <clears throat> like this is this position is different than this position. So this is how we collect the 
variant at each and every position of the of our samples genome compared to the reference genome. So when you collect all of these, we can tabulate them. Look at this, tabulate them, and based on their impact, we can generate a somatic score. This is an example of a mutability index uh, pipeline that one can run to understand <coughs> the importance of mutation at different positions in your uh, disease sample or in your tumor uh, sample compared to the uh, normal sample that you have also provided. So uh, in, for example, generally in cancer biology, these non-matches like the one that I have uh, marked here or highlighted here, which contains maximum somatic scores are actually uh, analyzed for their uh, mutational status or analyzed for their impact, analyzed for their, uh, to understand how they might uh, affect important genes that are involved in the tumor growth and tumor disease progression, et cetera, et cetera. So to, uh, to do this, we can actually yeah, uh, uh, take this data, right? And then for each and every position, we can generate something like this somatic score and this somatic score, okay, it's going up, okay. This uh, tabular information, we can subject that to different kinds of analysis in Python's environment to understand which positions are extremely important or which positions are statistically relevant compared to the other positions in the same list, right? This kind of analysis you can do with Python by, uh, by simply applying some um, different kinds of statistics in this <laughs> in this form of tabular data. So this is one way of analyzing uh, genomics data uh, to understand their impact. So we can now shift our focus to transcriptomics data and um, such a data actually transcriptomics data represent the mRNA expression, which is excellent way to analyze what is going on inside a cell, right? Because it actually observes active transcription of protein coding uh, uh, inside the cell. And this protein coding can be uh, variant or can vary depending upon the condition of the cell. Uh, they can have, for example, uh, um, different ways of uh, mixing and matching these exons to produce different isoforms of these proteins. And uh, there are studies which tells us or which shows us the number of isoforms increase with the uh, condition of the disease or altered condition of the cell, for example, in cancer, right? <clears throat> so that so that we can understand the impact, not only the impact of these uh, variants of these genes uh, in a quantitative manner, but also we can subject that to several different analysis to understand uh, not only this gene and several other genes impact in a, a much uh, a much different fashion also, right? In a variety of different ways. So in order to do that, we have to again run a basic pipeline like this, which will involve uh, taking the FASCU files and running through several steps of several process of uh, algorithmic analysis. In the end, we will reach this, an expression table, right? So this is a table that we will uh, use many different times, many, many, uh, many times in the in the program, um, simply because they are very intuitive to work with. And also RNA-seq data or expression table is the most used omics data type in, uh, in biological research or in any, uh, yeah, um, uh, automatic, automated uh, analysis of existing data or publicly available data, right? So what does this table tell us? Uh, unlike the genomics data, this tells us for each and every gene and for different sample, the expression level quantified by different normalization procedures. And what are these normalization procedures and how will they impact? You have all this information in the learn portal, but generally uh, to give you an idea, <laughs> This normalization or any form of normalization, even for that matter, Z-score normalization, will help us compare the expression levels of one gene compared to the other gene within the sample, across the sample, and also between the sample, right? A lot of these things can happen when we normalize the data. Okay, so that is one way to proceed. And then uh, <coughs> another form of data, actually, another type of data that we can definitely discuss uh, throughout the course of uh, this program is metagenomics data. So unlike the genomics data and transcriptomics data that you just heard, which uh, will come from only one type of organiz uh, organism, right? If you are doing this analysis for a model system like mouse, 
or, or, uh, or a virus like SARS, then you will get a transcriptomics and genomics data just from SARS or this mouse or from human for that side. But metagenomics data is actually completely different because we are looking at a sample that can contain millions and millions of microorganisms. And we are actually taking those uh, microorganisms uh, genomes and then uh, <coughs> trying to quantify uh, by number or identify uh, the uh, population of these microorganisms in the sample that we are dis discussing or that we are concerned with. And that can be related, right? The quantification of these microorganisms can lead, lead to understanding of how these quantified microbes are, <coughs> for example, abundant in some uh, some altered state of the uh, altered state of the sample and uh, and very balanced in some other state of the sample so this will straight away lead us to understand their role in our inside our body and uh, such an analysis is implicated in a variety of different situations like um, uh, uh, from from normal obesity and and even from normal digestive related uh, issues to all the way up to neurodegenerative diseases where it can affect completely different uh, part of our body. And uh, these are all very interesting also, and, and they are so, they are fast, uh, they, are, um, they are growing so, so fast that I, I, I think we can easily predict in, in another three to five years, metagenomics data will become the most analyzed data compared to transcriptomics data. So it's very interesting. If you are interested in uh, uh, working with such data, Please <coughs> check some associated resources. And also we have some programs coming up focusing on this uh, data analysis alone. So this is, this is a pipeline which actually analyzes, again, the FASTQ files. This time, not from one, from the sample, yes, but not from one organism, but from several different organisms. And such a data comes with its own complications as well. And we get around these complications in the library preparation process itself by focusing on one gene or at the, at the level of uh, <coughs> quanti at the level of a downstream analysis where we again can focus on one specific um, gene or one specific species depending upon the kind of data that you have but mostly this 16s amplicon sequencing data is what is used uh, widely in metagenomic in metagenomic studies and that will give you uh, the quantification or abundance of these different microbes, right? A variety of different microbes present in the sample. And when we take the sample for, for example, an altered state of the cell compared to the normal state of the cell, we can understand the impact of the abundance levels of these microbes uh, in those samples and hence how they inter uh, interfere with our biology in a very helpful way and also in a very hindering way. So this data can actually give rise to, uh, yeah, this abundance plot, obviously you can plot and analyze their relationship. But in the end, what will you get? Again, we will get a structured table like this. Unlike the transcriptomics data, instead of genes or the genes that are um, collected in, as rows, we have operational taxonomic units that are collected as rows and their abundance levels are recorded across different samples. And what are these OTUs? In short, these OTUs are, or they can be annotated to one particular species or genus of bacteria. Sometimes these OTUs are so specific, they can go, this annotation can go all the way up to species and strain related information. And sometimes uh, <clears throat> due to the specificity or due to the availability of the characterized data, they can, stop at different taxonomic ranks. So these, these things, right, unlike the other uh, structured data output, for metagenomics, we will get two outputs, right? One for you know, quantifying these OTUs and second one for annotating these OTUs. This is what we will get. So the discussion, so our analysis can actually consider at what level or at what taxonomic rank do we want to uh, combine, analyze, and uh, identify the trends within this metagenomics data using different platforms, right? Using R or Python, whatever platform that you want to use, you can use in the end. This is a structured data, and you can use several different analysis methods to understand the 
patterns behind it and trends behind this. So what will we do, right? What, what, how do, should we start and what will we do? From all of these structured data, we can do everything that is listed here, right? Of course, we are starting with uh, getting started with bioinformatics in Python, and then uh, yeah, some of this should change. And we can, for example, process data, data wrangling, subject this to data wrangling, visualization, and, and the processing of this, uh, of this data. We can use advanced visualization option to understand uh, the segregation of sample based on the data. For example, we can perform simple statistics analysis. We can perform uh, advanced statistical analysis like machine learning, et cetera. All of these are covered in this program. So how are we going to do that, right? If we want to uh, work with Python, we have to understand how Python can be accessed using different methods because some of these methods can work for some of you while some might not work for the other. We can, <coughs> first, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, there are three modes of working with the codes that we will deal with the, with, uh, uh, with the code blocks in this program and also in the associated resources. You can, for example, study and practice in the lesson themselves, right? That I will demonstrate you today. Uh, and or you can study the codes in the lesson and then apply it to your own Python interactive development environment that you have installed in your computer. Or you can study the code in the learn portal or in the lesson and then apply it to a shareable Jupyter notebook kind of environment like Google Colab and etc. Each one of these methods have their own advantages and limitations. If you want to keep in one window, then I prefer you to uh, work with the <coughs> learn portals tools, which I will explain how you can do that, right? And if you want to, if you do not want to keep installing uh, modules and libraries again and again, I can suggest you to install uh, Python and the Python Visual Studio Code and install the necessary modules once and be dealt with that. And for example, if you want to share your data with us and get our feedback on your assignments, on your practice, then Google Colab is the perfect way to do that, right? Okay. So um, how are these data interpreted in the, inside Python's environment, right? Any programming environment has its own strength in a way in which it is going to organize the data. And how are we going to exploit that organization to load our data into what format so that we can maximize the information without much needing or without <coughs> much, I mean, or without required or necessary, necessary uh, pre-processing done outside the Python environment, right? So Python has a different way of storing data. This is common to Python and R, which is of uh, two modern languages or modern scripting languages, right? Python can store your data in one direction and that is called a series or a vector. It's called a series in Python, it's called a vector in R. And Python can store it in two dimensions, that is matrix, and it can store it in three dimensions, those are arrays. Arrays can also be two dimensions though, so these names can uh, be used interchangeably. But what is the one thing that you observe between these three different data types? All of these data types are colored in one uniform color. So what do they represent? They represent that the series or matrix or array, they can take data of only one data type. If the data is, has to be stored as a series or a vector or a matrix or an array, all of the data has to be in the same data type, right? You cannot have, for example, situation like this, where this column is, uh, <coughs> uh, is character and these columns are numerical or float, right? And we can have in biological data, a variety of different combinations of this. We can have a column uh, that is uh, that tells which sample or which gene that this data is from. We can have a column that also tells, for example, um, some other information, categorical information, like whether this gene has mutation or not. That can be a logical uh, column also. Yes or no can also be happen. And also we can have some other categorical information like uh, uh, do we have, do we see treatment response for these samples, right? So these, different data types in one table right can be easily loaded into an object called data frame right this is this is this is a reworking or restructuring of 
a tabular format that is in some old languages and uh, script scripting languages, right? And data frame is the best way to load omics structured data because it accommodates everything. And it also enables processing in such a way that we don't lose information. We can extract information through multiple different methods. We can subject data frame themselves to statistical analysis and we can convert data frame into different types as required by some of these analysis. And eventually in the end, you will come across something like this a list, which is just a collection of bunch of these objects so that we don't have to, um, uh, we don't have to confine to the requirements of loading data into a data frame object or into vector or matrix or array. For example, data frame can be of different colors, but they have to be of equal length. You cannot have a differing length in any direction for data frame, right? At least in the horizontal direction, this can be accommodated by uh, including an NA value, but all of them has to have same uh, length or same number of entries. So that is some of the restrictions or some of the uh, requirements of loading these into different data structures in Python, but list does not have that. We don't use list a lot, but for some uh, packages and modules, they use um, da uh, data and analysis result and different forms of output into lists from which we can easily access different uh, of different um, components of the list to understand uh, what we have done so far. So <clears throat> this is how we will uh, this is how we will load the data into and interact with the data. And this is an example of how we can test ourselves in the learn portal, right? And this is the code. You can call this as a code playground and you can call, call this as a challenge uh, platform. So what it does is it gives some instructions for you to uh, try here. This is an editable code playground and you can edit and then run Python code and the results are going to come up here like this, right? We have several of these control. We have a place where you can drop a file so that that file can be accessed in this, in this code area. And once you have learned the code in the learn the code section, literally like this, and you can come here and practice in the test your knowledge or practice your code area section, right? We have inline comments to direct you and we have places where you can run your code or we can, you can, type your code and these will have simple challenges like uh, as simple as we would have left some part of the code intentionally so that you can complete and then uh, test your understanding of this code for loading data and etc cetera, etc cetera, right and if this code involves loading a file this is where you could drop a file and we will give a link for the file up above this code area code playground and you can for example refresh reload this part and for example, you can copy this code so that you can paste it in IDE or uh, this thing, uh, Colab environment. For example, you can get load packages and etc. loaded packages here, and you can stop the execution. You can refresh the whole status of the uh, Python code playground here. And for example, if you run this, uh, so how to do this uh, <clears throat> will be explained in learn the code section. And the learn the code section will look like this, right? What do we learn from here? We have blocks of explaining what needs to be done to the data using which function and using which option. And we have blocks of code explaining or showing you how to do that, right? This is exactly the block of code that you will be using to execute in different uh, IDEs and different uh, environments that suits you. Right? This is this we call learn the code section where it is structured like this. And any output from the code is also printed here so that you can compare your output with the output that we have pasted so that you are not lost in trying to understand. So for this purpose, we will use standard tools and standard uh, attributes, functions like finding out the size of the data, finding out the dimensions of the data, finding out what are the type of elements that we have in the data. For example, what are the data types like character, integer, float, categorical, logical, et cetera. For example, uh, we can find how many different ways or what are the ways that will help us select only part of the data. For example, we can use this option to select only one column 
or this option to select another column. So when to use this and when to use this can actually form, uh, can actually depend upon type of code that you are writing. Sometimes we can use this and sometimes we can use this depending upon what, how the output is going to be generated and um, what can follow after this, right? That that's also depends. And that is also a, a, a very generic way of using numbers to uh, extract information like a column or a row that can be very useful when you are uh, including these um, um, these type of extraction inside a loop. Okay, so that's what we will do. And we will use some specific uh, functions and attributes that can interact with the data frame. For example, we can get the statistical summary of the data frame. We can get the first few lines and last few lines of the data frame to check whether it is loaded perfectly or not. Right. So, so how are these coding challenge used? Something like this. From here and here, these are the example coding challenge. This is where we let you, for example, uh, load uh, the uh, important modules, right? So that you can load it in the environment, Python's environment. And then this is an example of a coding challenge where we say, okay, you can find the file link here, right click on it, save the file onto your computer, and then drag the file and drop it here. So once you drop it here, you will look at or you will observe that the file is loaded into this code playground and then the code uh, codes inside this code block can actually access the file by just calling by their name and once um, this is a solved puzzle once you have completed solving this puzzle you will see on screen output here and then if this is successful then you will see success in running the code and if you if you make a mistake and it will see uh, try again Right, that, that way you can uh, try solving these code challenges and then uh, test your knowledge of how you have learned this code uh, so far. Okay, let's go quickly. We are a little bit behind. So, this is just a beginning. First two sessions are going to be like this. And I mean, not even first two sessions, even in the next session, you are going to get your hands on to uh, some of the demo collabs that we have prepared for you so that you can follow along in the next few sessions. So these demo collabs, what will they do? They will take the codes from learn the code section as we have given here, right? They will take the code from here and then put it into the collab and show you how to um, execute that. Where is it? I actually forgot where is it? Yeah, how to execute this. So that's how this is actually done like this. We take the code and we run it. We discuss the output in each and every uh, code. So that's how it is done. So, so that you understand what sort of analysis is done. And this is done in an interactive way where you can follow along while I am uh, working on these uh, code blocks and then check uh, these outputs. And uh, you will also be uh, brief that these videos, session videos are available for asynchronous viewing and practicing also. Okay. We'll, this we will skip, we already have seen this. So yeah, this we, this also I will skip, I, we have seen this. So how are these studies used, right? For example, such an analysis <clears throat> is what is used in this study, which actually uh, uh, records <clears throat> uh, uh, omics data of seven different types and drug response data for the uh, patient derived cell lines for 90 different uh, drugs. So by expertly combining these two structured data, they can come up with several different methods with which they can identify um, which method works best to predict the treatment response of these different cell lines and what omics data contributed to the positive prediction or to the utmost accurate prediction of, this, uh, uh, of the treatment response from these cell lines. That's what the kind of study that you can also develop and generate once you have, once you have gone through uh, this program. So let's quickly go through this. We will learn a little bit more. And I quickly want to jump uh, to the last slide where I'm going to show you. For example, if you want to uh, incorporate uh, data science and data analytics using Python into this environment, this is a typical flow that you will go through. For example, you will think that you're going to spend a lot of time in this uh, data analysis part. But in fact, you are going to spend a lot of time in cleaning up the data in the exploratory data analysis that's going to shape up the kind of analysis that you will run here. 
So that is what you will experience by the end of this program, right? If we take, for example, a machine learning analysis that involves the random forest uh, uh, algorithm, the actual algorithm that runs or that predicts and that generates model can be summarized into four lines. But the data preparation, but the sample preparation, data cleaning, tidy up the data, the initial visualization that helps us understanding the patterns in the data, that can easily take up anywhere between 50 to 70 lines of code. So uh, we don't need so much of code because we have curated many of these data and then that can be summarized into, let's say, 10, 10 to 15 or maximum 20 lines of code, something like that. But in reality, when you are going to develop your own method, my, po my point is you are going to spend a lot of time in these areas in data processing and exploratory data analysis so that you can narrow down on the perfect and data analytics method that you want to apply and when you apply boom you will get uh, perfect results are very impactful results that you can gain from so with that i can conclude today's session and um, i have covered most of this and if you have any queries type it out in the chat and if not i'm going to pass it on back to Shigauri or sonalika who is going to be yeah who is going to discuss some of the uh, program related uh, syllabus and where to access what and registration process also. Uh, in short, yes, Niha, machine learning is going to be covered and we have something like uh, five or six different sessions focusing on machine learning. In fact, the third session will start with the basic machine learning, introduction to machine learning, and uh, you will be up and running by fourth or fifth session with machine learning in Python, okay? Okay, I will hand it over back to Shigori. Yes, thank you so much. So now to uh, cover the program details and registration, I would like to pass on the stage to Shubha. Yeah, thank you so much, Shigori. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Shubham Kumar. I'm the Business uh, Development and Marketing Associate here at Pine Biotech. So today I'll be covering your uh, registration part for the program. So, uh, Shrigori, could you confirm is my screen is visible? Yes. All right. So, as you can see that uh, this is a program page for biomedical data science in Python, in which you will be learning about the statistical analysis, data visualization, and machine learning. And here you can find the date, like it will be commencing from 20th Jan. Today was the first session. So uh, as you scroll down more, you will find the program overview. Here, uh, what uh, you can see is the uh, summarized part of the program, which you'll be learning about various topics and concepts like uh, machine learning, the for clinical and preclinical researches. Then you will get to see about the some of the project examples from an Omics Logic Learn platform. So yeah, like. Yes, and when you will scroll down a more, you will find an um, interactive session of uh, syllabus for the interactive sessions and a calendar where some of the dates are highlighted. So as you can see, uh, 20th Jan, which is today is highlighted on that particular day, we will be covering your uh, sessions. So today, as we have conducted a first session and on the right side, you can see the topics to be covered, like introduction to the program and objectives, and next session which we'll be conducting uh, conducting will be on 24th jan and we will be covering the data processing and exploratory analysis part and here you can see the various uh, dates and the topics which we'll be covering so coming down more um, you can see that uh, we have three different tenures for this program so one is for 45 days 60 days and 90 days so the common resources for the uh, all these tenures is uh, online tutorials uh, you will get along with that as i have earlier mentioned you will get the access for the project examples then you will get the access of the cloud pipeline for uh, from the uh, we have a t bio server cloud based uh, server so you can get the access of that to run your pipelines along with that as uh, sir has mentioned we will get the coding sessions and by chance, if you miss any of the sessions, then we'll also provide you with the session recordings along then online mentor and technical support. 
and years after the completion of this tenure, you will get a certification of completion. So the difference between this tenure is for 60 days, you can see uh, like we have an extra uh, like resources that is one on one mentor support will be providing you. And in the 90 days, uh, you will get along with the one on one mentorship, you will get an extra time to work on a project. Let's see if you have any project idea, research project idea. So you can uh, cover on the 90 days tenure and you will also get a chance to publish also and after that yes uh, the certification of completion and certificate of excellence will be providing you coming to the uh, fees or the price so as you can see uh, here the price is in usd so uh, for 45 days it is 150 for 60 days it is 300 and for 90 days uh, like it is 450 so let's say if uh, someone is from India, so here you can find on the top right a um, drop down menu where you can just simply click your uh, currency from the uh, place where you are residing. Then for the INR, the prices are uh, 7500, then for 60 days it's 9999, and for 90 days it's 14999. So, uh, like and how to proceed with this uh, so you simply have to click on this uh, buy now button and fill up your details and yes, uh, like we have several coupons for uh, low income countries like african nigerians and as well as uh, for phd scholars also we have some scholarships so we'll provide you with that coupon code you can simply enter your coupon code here and after that uh, click on this checkbox and select a payment method so this is your complete uh, registration part or the enrollment part for this program, Biomedical Data Science in Python. I'll share you the link of this so that uh, you can go through this after the session. Yeah. So if you have any queries uh, related to this, uh, please feel free to ask. Can the duration of course be extended later say after 45 days to 60 days by paying difference in a month yeah of course you can uh, extend your program so if you are enrolling for 45 days and uh, you want to enroll for 60 days then you can pay the difference all right so how much scholarship is available for phd scholars uh hello Shre, you can uh, like please mention your email id so that we can share you the details about the scholarships uh, via mail or you can simply contact us at yeah thank you shigori uh, so she has um, and, uh, given you the uh, contact details so you can mail us at marketing at omicslogic.com or uh, we have a what a number active on whatsapp that is 9876134120 so you can directly ping us on WhatsApp also. Is this course will get me a job? Um, not exactly. We can guarantee you uh, the job uh, part, but uh, yes, you can add this uh, certification and the experience in your CV so that it will uh, like uh, enhance your CV as well. And if you uh, like, our mentors will be. Uh, guiding you about the openings also so yes uh like you can uh there are chances you can get the job but we cannot guarantee that i mean in short can i chime in we don't provide placements garvit okay yes sir. so what we what we provide is excellence you go through the program you will get excellent guidance and excellent mentorship for trying to for using python related uh, analytics on biological data that itself is a very sought out skill set in today's bioinformatics world so if you uh, advertise that you have completed this course and you are an expert in using python to understand uh, omics data and you are doing a project in this that is going to uh, amplify the visibility or viewer visibility among your competitors in this particular uh, field so that is that is how we provide opportunity for to help with the job place, not placements to job opportunities, 
we have a page which lists the available jobs that we can get hold on, right? We have a team which is working on, yeah, exactly, for curating these job lists that are useful and that will be, um, that, that yeah, <clears throat> that are very um, relevant to bioinformatics and computational biology uh, up, um, uh, applications. So you can refer to that and, uh, and learn if some of them are, uh, 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 some of them are uh, applicable to you, you can apply to that, right? And, and if you, for example, work with us for your tenure or for, for extending this program into a research fellowship uh, internship or research fellowship program, that will make you work with us for three more months in which you can get a, a research project done that you can publish in learn, the LEARN portal or LEARN no Logic portal. You can, first of all, share uh, your project with your, uh, uh, in, in part of your CV and in the applications that people can go through your projects, like the students projects that Sri Gauri was talking about. And uh, two, if you have, uh, uh, if you have done excellent research, then you have possibility of extending that research to a, a paper, right? That is also possible. And <clears throat> what can this give you? This gives you valuable time with us and it gives us opportunity to understand you. So we can be part of your recommendation and reference letters also, because in the past people have uh, asked us or people have consulted us to um, provide them recommendation with. And of course, in variety of different places, if you get a recommendation letter from a, from a place where you have done a project, where you have worked on a project that adds to your value. So these things will help you in finding a job and in, in application towards a job and et cetera, right? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have one more query from Neha. Are there freely available alternatives to T bio platform that can be used after course completion? Um, it, I, that there could be freely available alternatives, but we are not going to discuss that. You are. Uh, uh, it's not ethical to discuss an alternative to <laughs> program that we are selling inside this sales pitch of the program, right? But anything free is not going to come as free, right? You you have to work on that. And uh, the other platforms have certain limitations and uh, um, uh, restrictions that TBIO Info platform does not have. Right? None, of the, none of the other platforms, either paid or free, have the flexibility of the TBIO Info platform. That I can say with the 10 years of experience in omics logic, or omics uh, related research, right? And um, none of the other platforms also have the interactive, interactive aspect of the outputs that you can get your hands on right and of course most importantly none of the other platforms have the 24 7 support that tbio info platform and pine biotech gives to right we of course check your inputs and check your support 24 7 and uh, some of us are placed in uh, some of us are based in uh, us and some of us are based in uh, in india so we cover most of the time zone and we will get back to you within 24 hours with a solution to whatever query that you are throwing at us. So that is what uh, makes TBIO Info Platform and the Pine Biotech and Learn Portal very unique uh, amidst the competitors, amidst the other options that you have around uh, you to learn this particular skill set. Okay. So that is a payment related question. You can answer that. Yeah, Shubham, uh, I Shubham, think, sorry, yeah. yeah, thank you. So, so I think uh, Sparsh uh, would uh, clearly uh, tell about the additional payment part or you can uh, mail us your, uh, you can uh, give us a mail ID. Uh, we can share with you details for that. Uh, yes, Shubham, exactly. Also, Amrita Kara, uh, sorry for the wrong pronunciation if I am doing. After 90 days, we do enter three months any additional payments. So uh, I'm unable to understand your question, but I am guessing it. Uh, if you're asking. Intern. 
three months intern. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, after ninety uh, days, like for ninety days, you will go through with the modules which we have mentioned, and um, Shubham has showed you a glimpse of the modules which are there in the program page. After you uh, gain those conceptual as well as hands-on and uh, hands-on practice of uh, these modules you can definitely we can definitely you can send uh, your cv to us we can uh, like there is a proper protocol which we follow for the internship part and after going through with your cv we will be mailing you out the steps of the internship and the pre-interview process so definitely uh, you can do internship with us in our company as well so there I is no the question, any additional I, payment for that for the internship. No, no, I think the question is something different. Are you Amrita Kara? Are you asking about the research internship or research fellowship uh, that we were talking about, or are you seeking internship position? Yeah, exactly. So the research program, research internship program, is a separate program altogether. Yes, yes, right? yes, yes, yes. That's yeah, yeah, yeah sir. Uh, basically, uh, in ninth, I'll I'll just briefly tell you in 90 days tenure if you could see on the screen uh they you will be having 45 days of training and the rest 45 days would be devoted to your uh, independent research project so uh, in 90 days tenure you will get both the opportunities but if you if your project work is incomplete and you still want to con uh, continue and get it uh, done and also work on your project for the publication part also then yes there are separate additional charges for it and according to the tenure or uh, according to the timeline uh, how much you will enroll for example for one month extra you are enrolling or two months or 45 days we'll uh, we'll charge you accordingly the fee is accordingly so uh, yes there is additional charges to it does this course cover cloud genomics what is cloud genomics if genomics analysis done over the cloud right if that is the case uh, that is what is actually um, T Bio Info Server is doing. Yes. Kind of. But you will not get to set up anything there. Right? We have set up everything in the server. You will access the server through the front end website. So that is what is going to cover. This is not a course to uh, help you with setting up the analysis platform, but this is a course that will help you to understand the logic behind. Um, how will how you can apply these different methods to omics data yeah so of course cloud cloud based genomics data analysis and omics data analysis you have to work on setting it up in i think in environment that you are referring to is um, um, aws and other ones others correct right aws and azure something like that yeah exactly yeah so um, those are all options that we do not cover unfortunately here and uh, uh, exactly yeah aws azure gct yeah exactly uh, but what i can assure you is you will plan or you you can learn how to compare different analysis methods from our course so that that can give you clarity in what to install and how to get get this done within aws and other options unfortunately we don't cover that in this in this program Thank you so much. So does anyone have any further queries? If so, we'll be ending today's meeting. All right, then, if no one has any further queries, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today's session. And for those of you who are not uh, enrolled for the program yet, I hope to see you all for the uh, next session as well. And with that, thank you, everyone, for joining and have a great day. Thank you.